Hey, Sox fans, it's a Locked On crossover. Lindsey Crosby, host of the Locked On MLB podcast, will join me in a moment to talk all things White Sox prospects. The names you know, Oscar Colas and Colson Montgomery, as well as some names that you might not be so familiar with. And how about players that might make an immediate impact in 2023? You are Locked On White Sox. Your daily Chicago White Sox podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Sox fans, welcome to Locked On White Sox. Thank you for making Locked On White Sox your first listen each and every day. We're free and available on all platforms, follow us on Twitter at Locked On Sox. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Locked On White Sox. Hey, I'm your host, Nick Murawski, a lifelong diehard Chicago White Sox fan, recording this podcast just blocks from the ballpark in beautiful Bridgeport. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Nick underscore uh, GGTV. Locked On White Sox is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day what to expect from our prospects uh, from oscar colas that's making a lot of noise in glendale arizona when could we see sean burke or, or noah schultz and what about prospects that might never see a uh, 35th in shields i uh, want to welcome to the podcast uh, the encyclopedia of prospects welcome lindsey crosby the host of lockdown mlb prospects thanks for joining the podcast lindsey thanks for having me and i gotta be honest I, i'm just glad that we have uh, more facial hair in the lockdown podcast <laughs> network i feel like I've, the longest time i'm the only bearded one and it's a glorious mustache Oh, I appreciate that. I feel like maybe there should be a little, you know, in honor of the NCAA, maybe a little, like a little bracket, a little facial hair bracket we can think about for lockdown. I don't know. Just like a thought. Uh, Lindsay, uh, I just got back actually from spring training, uh, seeing the White Sox, uh, Camelback Ranch, and a, a lot of, you know, players with the high numbers, no names on the back of the jerseys, but there's also a lot of names that Sox fans have been pretty familiar with. And i uh, got to start off with two guys, uh, Oscar Colas and Colson Montgomery. Oscar Colas is the guy that a lot of folks nationally, locally are saying he's going to make noise. He's going to break camp. He's going to be our starting right fielder. What can you tell us about Oscar Colas? So, a big thing on, on my show is I try to avoid doing comps because it gives people like an unrealistic expectation of what performance that player is going to do. But Oscar Colas is one of my favorites to do the stylistic comparison to. Like, okay, what type of player is he? Uh, so he is very much a corner outfield, uh, uh, you know, like a, like a right field power hitting, big arm defensive player. Uh, right fielder. And so it's, it's something where I think he's going to break camp as the starter in right field. I think mm -hmm. that he's going to be able to impact at a high level. The thing that surprised me in 2022 was he had such a quick adjustment back to professional baseball, you know, and, and, and MLB. And you saw the White Sox kept promoting him, trying to challenge him at the next level. He's in, Winston Salem for two months. He hits 311, 369, 475. And they're like, okay, okay, let's send him to Birmingham. He spends almost two months in Birmingham and just about everything gets better. Slugging goes up to 563. You know, he strikes out right around the same, but like the, the power doubles. He had more than twice the number of home runs. And so it, it kind of feels like he's ready, right? Uh, it, he, Still has a little work to do as far as chasing uh, stuff down and away, a slider, things like that. He's always going to be around that 18 to 20 percent uh, strikeout guy. He could play center field if you needed to, but because of the lack of top end speed, you're probably looking at again a right fielder, the plus arm, the really good reads, routes, reactions. He's going to be able to, despite the speed, give you somewhat around above average defense in right field. And then he has the tools to hit 25 to 30 home runs. Will he do that the first year? I don't know. But I think that rather soon, 
that's where you'll be looking at him as he'll bat he'll bat fourth or fifth. He'll hit 30 home runs. He'll strike out about 20% of the time. And all in all, he'll be a high batting average, uh, high on base contributor to this team. He has been saying all the right things in every article that I have read. Just give me more information. You know, he knows what he needs to work on. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and, you know, I think he might be six for his first 14 uh, early on in spring training. I saw him hit one on the screws when I was out there to to dead center uh, for a double uh, over the center fielder's head. Uh, And, and, you know, the power is going to come. We know we can hit the fastball. It's that breaking stuff that I'm, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, it's expected he'll he'll take some time to catch up to that. Uh, and, and we as Sox fans have been waiting for a right fielder to get excited about. And the fact that he's got a lefty bat is getting uh, everybody on the south side, uh, you know, pretty, pretty hyped. Uh, another name that, you know, he is he is skyrocketed uh, up the rankings is Colson Montgomery. And we've got Tim Anderson at short, but maybe Montgomery shifts to a second base or. You know, he, he might he might find his way somehow on this White Sox lineup. Uh, what should we expect from a guy like Colson Montgomery moving forward? So I was a little iffy on him going into last year about was he going to be a shortstop or did he would he have to move in kind of like a Corey Seager did where Corey Seager, you know, had to move. And, and I wasn't quite 100 percent sure. And then after the year that I saw last year, including getting to see him in person that brief time he was in Birmingham. He's on my dynasty team in my league or in my industry fantasy league. So the thing about Colson Montgomery is you look at the size, right? 6'4", 220, and what he's been able to do with that. He's been able to maintain the speed. He doesn't have blazing top end speed, but very long strides. And so it gives him decent range. He's, he's pretty good at going to his left. I think he can stick at shortstop. The arm is above average. Uh, and it's it's strong enough to make up for maybe not having time to get your feet set because it took you an extra beat to get to the ball. So I think defensively, he can stick it short. Is he going to be a gold glover at short? Probably not, but he'll be above average. And then he very much is that modern shortstop that that has good contact but can also hit for power. He's added about 15 to 20 pounds of muscle, and I think just about every single bit of it uh, fires when he sends a, a ball into left center. Uh, it kind of seems like that's his power alley. He'll still pull balls for home runs, but I'm 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 very confident in his ability to to hit at the big league level and hit for power and stay at short. I think if there's any real knocks on Colson Montgomery, it's that uh, speed wise, like I said, not the not the top end speed, and so you don't see him be much of a stolen base threat. He can go first to third on a base hit. He's got really good instincts and knows when to go, but the actual steals may not come around. But other than that, I feel like he answered a lot of questions last year with his performance, and he is no doubt the shortstop of the future now. Yeah, he's another guy that uh, we're very excited about uh, as Sox fans. Want to switch to arms uh, for a moment here. Uh, Davis Martin came in last season as kind of a – a six starter had some spot starts, helped out uh, with some of the injuries that the Sox had. Uh, looking for maybe who could fill that role, and maybe it is still Davis Martin. But we've got guys like Jonathan, Jonathan Stever, Sean Burke, Matthew Thompson. Uh, wondering if any of those guys, in, in your mind, uh, we might see at the big league level in small doses in 2023. I'm a really big fan of Sean Burke and of what he's done. I don't know how quickly we'll get to see him. Uh, He's one of those rare college pitchers that has more projection available. He missed time in college because of Tommy John, was a 2021 third rounder, but shot through the system. I think he finished at AAA last year. And strikeout rate of 11.4 strikeouts per nine, just kind of, I mean, I think he was in the top 30 for guys who had at least 100 innings in the minors last year. Uh, you can really tell that the two weapons that he has, as far as the fastball and the curveball, both of them are plus. The fastball is very, very good up in the zone. He can spot it anywhere, but it's got really good ride up. And then the curveball tunnels off of that very well. Uh, not a true 12 to 6. It has a little bit of a, of a tilt to it, but uh, very good. Kind of sits around 80 miles an hour or so. Works against lefties really well. Uh, the slider 
is two plane break as well, but more horizontal than vertical. So it's a different picture. And then the changeup is there, not necessarily great, but uh, the fact that he's really good, his, his windup is kind of short. It's almost like he's working from the stretch. He's got good command and the fastball has good velocity on it. I feel like he could very quickly be one of those, uh, call him up, use him in the bullpen in the second half of the year, uh, spot start him if you need to, and then look at him to break camp as a starter in 2024. Just a big fan of what I've seen him do and just how I've seen him get better since he's been a professional and been able to pitch every fifth day versus that college schedule you're on. Uh, very, very confident. He'll probably start off in Charlotte, but you'll see him at the big league level pretty soon, and I think he'll be pretty effective. That is uh, music to uh, all Sox fans' ears. Uh, so we're going to get to uh, lots of names that are maybe not necessarily household names, but important uh, players uh, to check in on, like Norge Vera and Brian Ramos. We're going to do that uh, more uh, on that in a moment. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire could feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. Uh, that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Then add your job and the uh, purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. You can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Uh, post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown MLB. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown MLB to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. All right, Lindsay. Um, listeners have been weighing in, getting some questions about a couple guys that uh, you know are, are not terribly—they're not household names, but we've heard of them. Uh, Christian Mania and Yolqui uh, Cespedes. Let's maybe start with Mania and continue that uh, pitching uh, pattern here. Uh, thoughts on Christian Mania, who's uh, right now number seven in the White Sox system? Yeah. So. Uh, 2019 IFA, he moved, he went through three different levels last year. I struggle a little bit to know how much of that move to the third level is actually a promotion and how much of that was we just wanted him to be in Project Birmingham. I have that little bit of issue every time and then how to evaluate guys at Project Birmingham. But when you look at what he did, the big thing for Christian Mina last year was getting a full season in. He was one of like five pitchers under the age of 20 to log at least 100 innings. Uh, and, and of that, he, he was, I think, second in the minors from that group in ERA and strikeout rate. Strikeout rate was almost 30%. And uh, just very much uh, kind of based around the fastball curveball combo. He added some, some good weight the last year, year and a half. He could touch about 97 with it now. Whereas when, when he got stateside, he was looking, you know, 90, 91, 92. Uh, the the curveball works well off of it, sits lower 80s. Another ball that not straight vertical, 11 to 5, so a little bit better against lefties. Uh, worked on a slider last year. It wasn't great when he used it, but it did noticeably get better throughout the year. So that makes me feel good that one more year of working with that is going to make it into a, an appreciable weapon. Uh, flash a, a, a changeup. It kind of looked like a splitter. Uh, ne needs to kind of clean that up a little bit. And then just some some kind of general delivery stuff. Not as, as smooth as you would like. Overthrows a little bit. A lot of stuff that you see from a youngster, but fixable. And like the big takeaways for me was you saw him appreciably get better. You saw him be able to handle the workload and you saw the makings of some really good pitches. The curveball is already a plus pitch. The fastball is probably above average already. And there's a lot of promise in the slider and changeup. And so he'll probably go back to double A Birmingham to start the year. And I'm thinking uh, if everything goes as well as it should, 
he could be a candidate to come at the very end of the year, get a start or two, or work out of the bullpen at the very end of the year, and then challenge for a job out of spring training next year. Whether or not he'll actually get it is different. Whether or not you need him or he's still healthy and still improving, but the tools are there. Looks very good. I've been very impressed with what I've seen from Christian Mania. Uh, another name that we've heard uh, for a couple of years now, uh, we'll go to the outfield, the Yolqui uh, Cespedes. And I don't know where he he fits in, rated the 13th in the White Sox system. Um, you know, he, he's got the arm, he can hit. Uh, but I've heard from folks that, you know, I just, I don't know if the White Sox are going to, you know, stick with this guy long term or if he just might be somebody that hangs around and uh, we never see him in a White Sox uniform on the South side. Uh, thoughts on Cespedes? I'm a little bit lower than the consensus on Yoki Cespedes. It, it, to me, it feels like his ceiling is probably fourth outfielder, a guy that, He's above average at a lot of different things. I think the power potential is above average. I think the defense is above average, the speed, the arm. So it's a lot of like raw tools. But it, it like he didn't appreciably improve those last year. He was struggling with breaking balls early. He finished the year still struggling with breaking balls. I know he had some back spasms in May and missed some time, but he never really worked out the struggles just looking lost at the plate against some of the breaking stuff. Uh, the strikeout rate hovered around 30%. The walk rate was, I want to say, 6.5% or so. And uh, I think there's a lot of promise there. Again, there's a lot of tools. It's going to be a player development challenge. And at this point, part of me wonders how much of this is normal development and how much of this is maybe a mental reset is needed. I, But I do think that he has the skill set to contribute at a major league level. It's just turning all of those raw tools into finished products. And I'm not quite sure what needs to change. I don't know if it's going to be something with him and his mindset, and he's going to want to have to do it. But the tools are there. I think having him in the mid-teens is probably the right pay place, acknowledging the ceiling isn't as high as we thought it would be. But he does have an MLB floor if you can work on some of these things. Uh, we'll go back to pitching for a moment, uh, and then we'll talk catching, uh, which yeah. that shouldn't take very long. <laughs> but uh, we'll go with uh, with a guy that's just outside of the top 10. Uh, and I've heard some positive things uh, about Norge Vera, you know, a, a pretty lively fastball. Uh, young, of course, uh, not sure where the timeline fits in, but another exciting pitching uh, prospect, I think, for the White Sox. Uh, what have you heard about Norge Vera? You explained the fastball really well. Like, it explodes out of his hand, right? I mean, it is it is one of the better fastballs in this system to me. Consistently sits around 96. I, I saw it last year touch 99. He may or may not hit 100 in, in spring. Like, it, it's, it's, that, uh, it, it's that good of a pitch. But then also, because of his delivery, and I can't really put into words why, but the ball, it, it's almost hard to pick up out of the hand. Right. And so it adds some deception to it. I think part of that's because he kind of comes across his body with the delivery, which maybe isn't the greatest thing, but it works out in this case. Uh, to go along with that, the slider, uh, I think it could be above average if he believed in it more. Like he throws it and you can tell he doesn't necessarily think it's going to work. It's a good slider, sits low to mid 80s. He just, he needs to throw it a little bit harder and believe in it a little more. And then the the changeup, uh, it has good drop to it, but it doesn't have a lot of that usual changeup kind of run to the arm side. So I'd like to see the changeup improve a little bit to maybe get to average. But I think he, I think he's probably going to go back to uh, back to high A Winston Salem to start this year, and I could see him as a middle to back end of the rotation kind of guy. And if for some reason you can't get that third pitch to come around and you're just a fastball slider guy, the fastball is so good that you're looking at a higher leverage relief opportunity at worst. But the big thing last year was just the velocity dropped later in the year because he was, he was tired. It was, it was his first year stateside in a full season of ball. And you could see that effect start to happen on him late. So I just want to see him get a full year this year. Even if he looks great, I'm probably not calling him up at the end of the year because I just want him to pitch every fifth day as much as possible to polish some of these fantastic raw tools. Yeah. Let's talk about a, a couple guys that the pitchers uh, will be throwing to per perhaps uh, at the big league level. I'm not sure about that. Carlos Perez and 
Uh, Adam Hackenberg can go kind of either way, maybe 30th uh, in the White Sox system, and then maybe out of the top 30. Uh, there isn't uh, a lot of traffic to make, uh, <laughs> you know, to make obstacles, I guess, to the big league. The White Sox are just so depleted in the catcher department. Uh, Perez, Hackenberg, do you see any of those as potential dark horse uh, candidates that maybe uh, help out the White Sox in the near future? So of the two of these, I think that Hack Hackenberg is better defensively. I think that Perez is better offensively, but the defense is much better than the offense. Both of them profile as that second catcher defense first kind of you're assigned to a specific pitcher and you catch him very, very well. Um, Perez has a, has a decent arm. It, it would be graded as probably fringy, but he has really good movements to get the ball out. Uh, Hackenberg legitimately has a good arm. It's a fantastic arm. Uh, the issue with Hackenberg is his swing is really kind of stiff. Uh, and he has bat speed issues because of it. Can't always catch up to fastballs, but then again, can get fooled by a breaking pitch or, or, or an off speed. So Perez is technically the better hitter. I still think the ceiling is probably fringe to average on the hit tool for Perez. And then Hackenberg is... Above average, if not plus defensively, but you're going to have questions of can he hit his weight at the big league level? Uh, I think if it was me, this is my farm system, I'm drafting probably three, maybe four <laughs> catchers this year, kind of like the Braves did last year. The Braves went out and got multiple catchers in the draft last year. I'm probably going for multiple catchers in this draft. There's no real uh, stud catchers available in this draft, but there's a like it's a really it's really good depth. There's a lot of like guys that could be perfectly average at the big league level and could actually make it. And I think that's probably a thing you need to do is go out and get a couple catchers just to supplement the depth in the system. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a good prediction. Uh, Want to get your take on some dark horse candidates uh, and that might have an impact on this season in uh, maybe 2024. And how about some names that might never wear a White Sox uniform? Uh, more on that uh, in a moment. Okay, so we are, uh, Lindsay, we're, I wouldn't say we're loaded with infielders, but guys like Lenin Sosa, Jose Popeye Rodriguez, Brian Ramos, uh, Ramos had a walk-off single the other day in spring training. All of them have kind of raised some eyebrows uh, with Sox fans. You've got Mancada that it should be at the hot corner for a while now. Anderson, you know, he's got a couple of years left. Will they lock him up long term and keep him in a White Sox uh, uniform for the rest of his career? But second base seems to be open after this year with Elvis Andres just on a one year contract uh, of guys like Sosa, Rodriguez, Ramos. Do you see one or maybe all three or maybe two of them that, you know what? They might be traded. They, there isn't a direct path to the Chicago White Sox. And there are other teams that, you know, might be looking for their services. And, and perhaps when the trade deadline comes around, maybe the White Sox package them up uh, to look and get an arm or something for the stretch. Uh, the one most likely to get moved to me is Ramos. So when you look at kind of the package of what, and, and I hate to take him away from Lewis Robert. It's just, it's the whole, the system's always been very good with the Cuban international free agents. Uh, but when you look at the package, they've tried him at second. He's okay at second, but he's much better as a third baseman. And like you pointed out, uh, it is third base is, is, is occupied right now. And the thing is, you have Colson Montgomery, and he profiles he can stay at short. But if you re-sign Tim Anderson, he can kick out to third. If Moncada's holding third, he can kick into second. He's so he's very versatile. And so Ramos, to me, you can see. The, the power is somewhere between above average and plus. I've seen him drive balls out to right center that just like, look like they're going to never come down. But he's also aggressive at the plate. He's prone to chase sometimes. And sometimes he'll try to pull a pitch. He should just be driving. And so to me, it's very much a scenario of the tools are obvious, right? You can point to it and you can say, yeah, his speed's not great. But his defense, he's going to be an above average, uh, average or above average defender at third. He's got above average power potential. He's going to have at least an average bat. Uh, he's a, a very intelligent player. He learned, uh, he taught himself English when he got to the States. Uh, and so packaging him up, I think he can be the centerpiece of a deal to go out and get something at the deadline. Uh, what you get, I'm not sure, other than maybe some catching. <laughs> but 
Uh, Ramos just feels like he's the one most likely to move because he's immediately blocked, but he has uh, a ceiling that other teams can see and can think, oh yeah, I can fix that guy. Yeah. I, I, and I know a lot of teams, you know, they, uh, they might overvalue their, their own guys, their own prospects, but I have felt the White Sox have held on to guys maybe far too long that are just blocked. And, uh, you know, so I, I have a feeling just, I have a feeling this summer, uh, mm-hmm. we might see some of those guys moved uh, before I get to your, maybe your dark horse candidate for this White Sox team. I want to just uh, pick your brain on Noah Schultz, uh, a lot of excitement for Noah Schultz here locally and uh, just want to know what you're hearing. Uh, you know, uh, just he's young, but boy, uh, he's got some he, he's got some upside. He's he's really, really interesting. Right. Uh, what? OK, so for those of you who don't remember Noah Schultz, 6'9", 220, he would be one of the tallest uh, starting pitchers in the big leagues if he makes it. The odds are against him based on the size. But here's the thing that I think you can fix that takes Noah Schultz to the next level. The fastball is already really, really good. I mean, it it, uh, kind of like we talked about earlier, explodes out of the hand, has a ton of of late run to it and sink. So so it'll come in on your hands. It'll break your bat. You'll roll over it for a weak grounder. Uh, But he throws from a really interesting like wind up and the slots a lot lower than you would think. And so you almost lose some of the advantage of being so incredibly tall because you're deliberately lowering the release point. And, and, and it helps the delivery helps with keeping the, the arms and the legs in sync, which is incredibly tough when you're incredibly tall. So that's fine. I do want to see them work with uh, the release point and the arm angle and increase that a bit. The slider, I think, would uh, would benefit from that. It's a it, it's a hard sweeper right now, and a lot of that movement is late. But if you can raise the angle of the arm, you can turn that into two plane break, where you're going to either face a fastball that's coming incredibly downhill, that's going to come in on your hands and drop, or you have a slider coming in that's going to dart away from you and go out of the zone. You combine those with a changeup. I really think it's something uh, you, you have a guy who could absolutely be a number three, number two in a rotation because of the physical tools he has. It's just a matter of how can you optimize what he's doing and, and you know, the curveballs, you know, I'm sorry, the, the, the slider works for both lefties and righties. The changeup is there to kind of keep guys off of righties, give them something, uh, give them something else to work against righties, fix the, the, release point in the arm slot and you've got a guy who is going to be completely unusual that no hitter has seen a pitch from this angle uh take that movement and it's going to be that much harder to hit him unusual angles uh, bring a lot of white Sox fans to the chris sale uh, vision <laughs> uh, which wasn't too long ago but yeah uh i could see that repeatable motion difficult for someone of that uh, size so and he's got uh, it yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I got to pick your brain on dark horses. Um, our beat reporter for MLB.com, Scott Merkin, uh, singled out Edgar Navarro as somebody not listed on the team's 30, but maybe emerges and, and helps out uh, with a bullpen uh, that, you know, we're going to need some help with Garrett Crochet uh, coming back from Tommy John the first couple months. And obviously Liam Hendricks battling something bigger than baseball, uh, maybe not necessarily a pitcher, but a- another player that you might see coming out of nowhere uh, to make an impact with this White Sox team. So I actually like right-hand pitcher, Eric Adler, like just big fan of his 2022 sixth rounder out of Wake Forest. Um, and the the thing that's, that's great here is the fastball is already a major league caliber fastball. The reason why I like him this year is those Wake Forest pitchers are so advanced as far as biomechanics, as far as development. I mean, you have an affiliate there in Winston-Salem, so the coaching staff knows this already, but they're so far along with developing their pitches. He has fantastic spin rates to his fastball, to his slider. They call it a death slider. Like that's how good this thing is. It's probably one of the best sliders in the minor leagues right now. And he's, he was drafted last year. Uh, The whole reason that he was available in the sixth round is he has a little biomechanical stuff and delivery. You have to figure out once you get that figured out, I absolutely love him to make a huge impact 
uh, and to be a guy that I think eventually can be a closer for this team because the slider is that good. It's going to be something kind of like we talk about Devin Williams and people talk about what his, you know his pitches, those legendary pitches that these closers have. This death slider will be that for Eric Adler. Just hearing death slider gets me all kinds of excited uh, for this guy. Uh, Lindsay, uh, I know I speak for all of the Locked On White Sox listeners. We have been educated. Thank you so very much uh, for your time. Please, where can we find all of your great work? I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My show, Locked On MLB Prospects, available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Um, and then if you have questions for the show, we do mailbags every single Monday. So send those to me. We'll put your question in the next show next Monday. Can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, Lindsey Crosby from Lockdown MLB Prospects. Folks, thank you so very much for making this podcast part of your daily routine. You can find the Lockdown White Sox podcast absolutely everywhere. You find your podcast. We are on Twitter at Lockdown Sox. You can find me on Twitter at Nick underscore GGTV. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get your questions in for Wednesday's mailbag, LockedOnSox at gmail.com. Thanks for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen. Now for your second listen, after you've listened to Lockdown MLB Prospects, check out Lockdown Fantasy Baseball. Uh, win your league by listening to Matt and Dom every day as they bring you the best fantasy draft strategies. Find Lockdown Fantasy Baseball wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. On the next episode, it's Mailbag Wednesday. Also, I'll recap Tuesday afternoon's White Sox-Milwaukee Brewers game. It's on NBC Sports Chicago. Hey, I really appreciate you making time for the Lockdown White Sox podcast. I'm Nick Morowski. Until next time, go Sox.